So I'm going to talk to you about the political chemistry of oil spills and why this is an incredibly important long, oily, hot summer and why we need to keep ourselves from getting distracted. But before I talk about the political chemistry, I actually need to talk about the chemistry of oil. This is a photograph from when I visited uh, Prudhoe Bay in Alaska in 2002 to watch the Minerals Management Service testing um, the, their ability to burn oil spills in ice. And what you see here is you see a little bit of crude oil, you see some ice cubes, and you see two sandwich baggies of napalm. The napalm is burning there quite nicely. And the thing is, is that oil is really an abstraction for us as the American consumer. We use, we're 4% of the world's population, we use 25% of the world's oil production, and we don't really understand what oil is until you check out its molecules, and you don't really understand that until you see the stuff burn. So this is what happens as that burn gets going. It takes off, it's a big whoosh. I highly recommend that you get a chance to see crude oil burn someday, because you will never need to hear another uh, poli-sci lecture on the geopolitics of, of oil again. And it'll just bake your retinas. So there it is, the retinas are baking. Let me tell you a little bit about this chemistry of oil. Oil is a stew of hydrocarbon molecules. It starts off with the very small ones, which are one carbon, four hydrogen, that's methane, it just floats off. Then there's all sorts of intermediate ones with middle amounts of carbon. You've probably heard of benzene rings, they're very carcinogenic. And it goes all the way over to these big, thick, galumphy ones that have hundreds of carbons, and they have thousands of hydrogens, and they have vanadium and heavy metals and sulfur and all kinds of craziness hanging off the sides of them. Those are called the asphaltines. They're an ingredient in asphalt. They're very important in oil spills. Let me tell you a little bit about the chemistry of oil in water. It is this chemistry that makes oil so disastrous. Oil doesn't sink. It floats. If it sank, it would be a whole different story as far as an oil spill. And the other thing it does is it spreads out the moment it hits the water. It spreads out to be really thin, so you have a hard time corralling it. The next thing that happens is the light ends evaporate, and those, some of the toxic things float into the water column and, and, and kill fish eggs and, and smaller fish and things like that, and shrimp. And then the asphaltines, and this is the crucial thing, the asphaltines get whipped by the waves into a frothy emulsion, something like mayonnaise. It triples the, the amount of, of oily, messy goo that you have in the water, and it makes it very hard to handle. It also makes it, it's very viscous. Um, when the Prestige sank off the coast of Spain, there were big, floating cushions the size of sofa cushions of emulsified oil with the consistency or the viscosity of chewing gum. It's incredibly hard to clean up. And every single oil is different when it hits water. When the chemistry of the oil and water also hits our politics, it's absolutely explosive. For the first time, American consumers will kind of see the oil supply chain in front of themselves. They, make a, they have a eureka moment when we suddenly understand oil in a different context. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the origin of these politics because it's really crucial to understanding why this summer is so important, why we need to stay focused. Nobody gets up in the morning and thinks, wow, I'm going to go buy some three carbon to 12 carbon molecules to put in my tank and drive happily to work. No, they think, oh, I have to go buy gas. I'm so angry about it. The oil companies are ripping me off. They set the prices and I don't even know. I am helpless over this. And this is what happens to us at the gas pump. And actually, gas pumps are specifically designed to diffuse that anger. You might notice that many gas pumps, including this one, are designed to look like ATMs. I've talked to engineers. That's specifically to diffuse our anger because supposedly we feel good about um, ATMs. <laughs> that shows you how bad it is. But actually, I mean, this, this feeling of helplessness comes in because most Americans actually feel that oil prices are the result of a conspiracy, not of, of the vicissitudes of the world oil market. And the thing is, too, is that we also feel very helpless about the amount that we consume, which is somewhat reasonable because, in fact, we have designed a system where if you want to get a job, it's much more important to have a car that runs to have a job and keep a job than to have a GED. And that's actually very perverse. Now, there's another perverse thing about the way we buy gas, which is that we'd rather be doing anything else. This is BP's gas station in downtown Los Angeles. It is green. It is a shrine to greenishness. Now, you think, why would something so lame work on people so smart? Well, the reason is, is because when we're buying gas, we are very invested in this sort of cognitive dissonance. I mean, we're angry at the one hand, and we want to be somewhere else.
else. We don't want to be buying oil. We want to be doing something green. And we get kind of in on our own con. But you, you'll also find, I mean, and this is funny, like it, it looks funny here, but in fact, that's why the slogan Beyond Petroleum worked, but it's also part of our, it's an inherent part of our energy policy, which is we, are, we don't talk about reducing the amount of oil that we use. We talk about energy independence, we talk about hydrogen cars, we talk about biofuels that haven't been invented yet. And so this is, cognitive dissonance is part and parcel of the way that we deal with oil. And it's really important to dealing with this oil spill. Okay, so the politics of, of, of oil are very moral in the United States. It, it, the, the oil industry is like a huge, gigantic octopus of, of engineering and finance and everything else, but we actually see it in very moral terms. This is an early on photograph. You can see we had these gushers. Early journalists looked at the spills and they said it's a filthy industry, but they also saw in it that people were getting rich for doing nothing. They weren't farmers, they were just getting rich for stuff coming out of the ground. It's the Beverly Hillbillies, basically. But in the beginning, this was seen as a very morally problematic thing, long before it became funny. And then, of course, there was John D. Rockefeller. And the thing about John D. is that he went into this chaotic, wild east of, of oil industry, and he rationalized it into a vertically integrated company, a multinational. It was terrifying. You think Walmart is a terrifying business model now. Imagine what this looked like in the 1860s or 1870s. And um, it also is kind of the root of how we see oil as a conspiracy. Uh, but what's really amazing is that um, Ida Tarbell, the journalist, went in and did a big expose of Rockefeller and actually got the whole antitrust laws put in place. Um, but in many ways, that image of the conspiracy still sticks with us. And here's one of the things that, uh, that, that Ida Tarbell said. She said, he has a thin nose like a thorn. There were no lips. There were puffs under the little colorless eyes with creases running from them. Okay, so that guy is actually still with us. And I mean, this is a very pervasive, this is part of our DNA. And then, then there's this guy, okay? So you might be wondering why it is that every time we have high pr oil prices or an oil spill, we call these CEOs down to Washington and we sort of pepper them with questions in public and we try to shame them. And this is something that we've been doing since 1974 when we first asked them, why are there these obscene profits? And we've sort of personalized the whole oil industry into these CEOs and we take it as, uh, you know, we, we, we look at it on a moral level rather than looking at it on a legal and financial level. And so I'm not saying that these guys aren't liable to answer questions. I'm just saying that when you focus on whether they are or are not a bunch of greedy bastards, you don't actually get around to the point of making the laws that are either going to change the way they operate or you're going to get around to um, really reducing the amount of oil and reducing our dependence on oil. So I'm saying this is kind of a distraction, but it makes for good theater and it's powerfully cathartic as you probably saw last week. <laughs> so the thing about water oil spills is that they are very politically galvanizing. I mean, these pictures, this is from the Santa Barbara spill. You have these pictures of birds. They, they really influence people. This, when the Santa Barbara spill happened in 1969, it formed the environmental movement in its modern form. It started Earth Day. It also um, put in place the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. Everything that we are really stemmed from this period. I think it's important to kind of look at these pictures of the birds and understand what happens to us. Here we are, normally we're standing at the gas pump and we're feeling kind of helpless. We look at these pictures and we understand for the first time our role in the supply chain. We connect the dots in the supply chain and we have this kind of, as, as, as voters, we have kind of a eureka moment. This is why these moments of these oil spills are so important. But it's also really important that we don't get distracted by the theater or the morals of it. We actually need to go in and work on the roots of the problem. One of the things that happened with the two previous oil spills was that we really worked on some of the symptoms. We were very reactive as opposed to being proactive about what happened. And so what we did was we actually we made moratoriums on the east and west coasts on drilling. We stopped drilling in Anwar. But we didn't actually reduce the amount of oil that we consumed. In fact, it's continued to increase. The only thing that really reduces the amount of oil that we consume is much higher prices. As you can see, our own production has fallen off as our reservoirs have gotten old and expensive to drill out. We only have 2% of the world's oil reserves. 65% uh, of them are in the Persian Gulf. One of the things that's happened because of this is that 
since 1969, the country of Nigeria, or the part of Nigeria that pumps oil, which is the Delta, which is two times the size of Maryland, has had thousands of oil spills a year. I mean, we've essentially been exporting oil spills when we import oil from places without tight environmental regulations. That has been the equivalent of an Exxon Valdez spill every year since 1969. And we can wrap our heads around the spills because that's what we see here. But in fact, these guys actually live in a war zone. There's a thousand battle-related deaths a year in this area, twice the size of, of Maryland. And it's all related to the oil. And these guys, I mean, if they were in the US, they might be actually here in this room. They have degrees in political science, degrees in business. They're entrepreneurs. They don't actually want to be doing what they're doing. And it, it's sort of one of the other, um, the other groups of people who pay a price for us. The other thing that we've done as we've continued to increase demand is that we kind of play a shell game with the costs. One of the places um, we put in a, a big oil project in Chad with Exxon. So the US taxpayer paid for it, the World Bank, Exxon paid for it. And we put it in, there was a tremendous banditry problem. I was there in 2003, we were driving along this dark, dark road, and the guy in the green stepped out, and I was just like, ah, oh, this is it. <laughs> um, and, then, and then the guy in the, in the Exxon um, uh, uniform stepped out, and we realized it was okay. They have their own private sort of army around the, the oil fields. But at the same time, Chad has become much more unstable, and, and we are not paying for that price at the pump. We pay for it in our taxes on April 15th. We do the same thing with the price of, of policing the Persian Gulf and keeping the shipping lanes open. This is 1988. We actually bombed two Iranian oil platforms that year. And that was the beginning of an escalating US involvement there that we do not pay for at the pump. We pay for it on April 15th. We can't even calculate the cost of this involvement. The other place that is sort of supporting our dependence upon oil and our increased um, consumption is the Gulf of Mexico, which was not part of the moratoriums. Now, what's happened in the Gulf of Mexico, as you can see, this is a minerals management diagram of, of wells for gas and oil. It's become this intense industrialized zone. It doesn't have the same resonance for us that the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge has, but it should. I mean, it's a bird sanctuary. Also, every time you buy gasoline in the United States, half of it is actually being refined along the coast because the Gulf actually has about 50% of our refining capacity and a lot of our marine terminals as well. So the people of the Gulf have essentially been subsidizing the rest of us through a less clean environment. And finally, American families also pay a price for oil. Now, on the one hand, the price at the pump is not really very high when you consider the actual cost of the oil. But on the other hand, the fact that people have no other transit options means that they pay a large amount of their income into just getting back and forth to work, generally in a fairly crummy car. If you look at people who make $50,000 a year, they have two kids, they might not have three jobs or more because they're, and they have to really commute. They're actually spending more on their car and fuel than they are on taxes or on health care. And the same thing happens at the, at the 50th percentile of around 80,000. This is, gasoline costs are a tremendous drain on the American economy. Um, but they're also a drain on individual families. And it's kind of terrifying to think about what happens when prices get higher. So what I'm going to talk to you about now is what do we have to do this time? What are the laws? What do we have to do to keep ourselves focused? One thing is we need to stay away from the theater. We need to stay away from the moratoriums. We need to focus really back again on the molecules. The moratoriums are fine, but we do need to focus on the molecules on the oil. One of the things that we also need to do is we need to try to not kind of fool ourselves into thinking that you can have a green world before you reduce the amount of oil that we use. We need to focus on reducing the oil. What you see in this top drawing is a schematic of how petroleum gets used in the US economy. It comes in on the side. The useful stuff is the dark gray. And the unuseful stuff, which is the, it's called the rejected energy, uh, <laughs> the waste, goes up to the top. Now, you can see that the waste far outweighs the actual useful amount. And one of the things that we need to do is not only fix the fuel efficiency of our vehicles and make them much more efficient, but we also need to fix the economy in general. We need to remove the perverse incentives to use more fuel. For example, we have an insurance system where the person who drives 20,000 uh, 20, miles a year pays the same insurance as somebody who pays 3,000. We actually encourage people to drive more. We have policies that reward sprawl. We have all kinds of policies. We need to have more mobility choices. We need to make the gas price better reflect the real cost of oil. And we need to shift subsidies from the oil industry, 
which is at least $10 billion a year, into something that allows middle class people to find better ways to commute, whether that's getting a much more efficient car and, and also kind of building markets for new cars and new fuels down the road, this is where we need to be. We need to kind of rationalize this whole thing. And, and you can find more about this policy. It's called STRONG, which is secure transportation reducing oil needs gradually. And the idea is, instead of being helpless, we need to be more strong. They're up at newamerica.net. What's important about these is that we try to move from feeling helpless at the pump to actually being active and to really sort of in thinking about who we are, having kind of that, that special moment where we connect the dots actually at the pump. Now, supposedly, oil taxes are the third rail of American politics, the no-fly zone. I actually, I, I agree that a dollar a gallon on oil is probably too much, but I think that if we started this year with three cents a gallon on gasoline and upped it to six cents next year, nine cents the following year, all the way up to 30 cents by 2020, that we could actually significantly reduce our gasoline consumption, and at the same time, we would give people time to prepare, time to respond, and, time, and we would be raising money and raising consciousness at the same time. Let me give you a little sense of how this would work. This is a gas receipt, hypothetically, for, for a year from now. The first thing that you have on the tax is you have a tax for a stronger America, 33 cents. So you're not helpless at the pump. And the second thing that you have is kind of a warning sign, very similar to what you would find on a cigarette pack. And what it says is the National Academy of Sciences estimates that every gallon of gas you burn in your car creates 29 cents in health care costs. That's a lot. And so this, you can see that you're paying considerably less than the healthcare costs on the tax. And it also, it, it kind of, it's, the hope is that you, you start to be connected to the whole greater system. And at the same time, you have a number that you can call to get more information on commuting or a low interest loan on a better, a different kind of car or whatever it is that you're going to need to actually reduce your gasoline dependence. Um, with this whole sort of suite of policies, we could actually reduce our gasoline consumption, by, or our, our oil consumption, by 20% 20, uh, 20 by 2020, so 3 million barrels a day. But in order to do this, one of the things that we really need to do is we need to remember we are people of the hydrocarbon. We need to keep our minds on the molecules and not get distracted by the theater, not get distracted by the cognitive dissonance of the green possibilities that are out there. We need to kind of get down and do the gritty work of reducing our dependence upon this fuel and these molecules. Thank you. Investment in broadband high-speed internet can help small businesses create new American jobs. Small businesses are being formed dreams are being launched. And at AT&T, we're investing billions to upgrade and build out our wired and wireless networks. Now is not the time to stall momentum or stifle innovation or investment. Jobs, dreams, and the future are at stake. AT&T, your world delivered.